view of the universe, how science looks at uh, the birth of the universe, Big Bang, Planck Epoch, cosmic inflation, fusion of hydrogen atoms, stars, two trillion galaxies, 760 million planets, trillions and trillions of planets, probably many more habitable planets. So this is how human beings have created a very successful model, taking in all the theories from cosmology to quantum physics to special relativity to general relativity and on Saturday or whenever we have two hours we go over all these theories in a way that ordinary regular people can understand them without knowing the math. But now what we want to do is talk about how do we know what we know. Okay, And so how do we know what we know is through a quality of experience that now the term is becoming popular in consciousness literature, it's called qualia. Q-U-A-L-I-A. -A. The term has been around in the Western literature for lots of years, 1925 or so. But there's a philosopher of, of science and philosopher of consciousness, David Chalmers, has made it very popular. So if anyone reads consciousness literature, they will know what qualia is. <coughs> a quantum is a unit of measurement. So when you talk about quantum, it's the smallest indivisible unit of energy in which waves are emitted or absorbed. So quantum of light is a photon. Quantum of electricity, electron. Quantum of gravity, so-called graviton. Uh, although no one has seen them recently, they identified what they thought were gravity waves when two black holes collided 200 million years ago. So quanta are unit of measurement, <clears throat> but qualia are qualities of consciousness, very basic qualia. So I'll take you through now uh, what experience of qualia is. You can close your eyes <coughs> and um, on the screen of your consciousness, uh, here, here. I shouldn't even say screen of your consciousness, although I can say in consciousness, hear the sound of a church bell as it tolls in the evening. Hear the sound of thunder. <coughs> hear the sound of a cough. Hear the sound of a baby crying. Hear the sound of gunfire. Okay, so now let's move to another qualia experience. Keep your eyes closed. Feel the rough bark of a tree. Feel the soft petals of a rose. Feel the skin of a newborn baby. Feel sand as you walk on the beach with bare feet. Feel the sharp edge of a knife. Feel a nice wet kiss on your lips. Let's move to another quality experience. See a beautiful sunset on the ocean. See a flash of lightning in the sky. See a beautiful 
beautiful red rose. See a lush green meadow. See the face of someone you love. See a waterfall. Okay, let's move to another quality experience. Taste a strawberry. Taste chocolate ice cream. Taste garlic. Taste an apple. Taste a pear. Taste a banana. Taste almonds. And finally, let's move to another quality experience. Smell a pine forest. Smell an Italian kitchen. Smell the locker room of your gym. Smell a favorite perfume. Okay, now we'll take all these qualia. You understand what qualia are? Qualities of experience. We'll combine them a little bit. So, see yourself sitting next to a waterfall that's flowing down a hill or a precipice into a river. Hear the sound as you see yourself next <coughs> to the waterfall. Feel the spray of the water on your skin. Smell the fragrance of the rainforest. Look up into the sky and see clouds rolling. Hear the sound of thunder. See flashes of lightning. See a loved one coming through the forest towards you. Butterflies flittering around you. An eagle swoop, swoop, swooping down from a mountain top. As you sit next to the waterfall, hearing its sound, feeling the spray, and put on your headphones and listen to the Beatles. And now just play with this scene. Do anything you want with it. Okay, take a few deep breaths and slowly open your eyes. So first of all, let's examine this process. What we experience right now are what are referred to as qualia. Qualities of experience. But the experience is occurring where? In consciousness, in awareness. And what is the experience? It is a modification of consciousness itself. Right? Where was the sunset before you had the thought? Nowhere. It was in consciousness, and as soon as you had the thought, then consciousness modified itself, showed up as the sunset. Or you, you know, saw a flash of lightning in the sky. Where was the flash of lightning in the sky before you had the intention? In consciousness. As what? As a possibility. Because consciousness is only a field of possibilities. Possibility waves, and then the intention evokes the appropriate response. So 
So these are all qualia, we can call them mental qualia. There's little bits I could say, think of the color red or think of the color violet. But now we've given names to this, right? If before we give names to this, before they are human constructs, they're just raw experiences that a baby would be having. And where would it experience all this? In itself. Till you showed up and you said, you know, that's a tree. And you pointed at that and then you said, that's you. And now you create the subject object split. So you is also a bundle of qualia. This is a bundle of qualia. All mental activity is a bundle of qualia. But so is all perceptual activity a bundle of qualia. But now what we have is what we call subject-object split. Okay, I'm here and you are there. In fact, when you ask people, where are you? They usually say, I'm here. But actually, if you go inside, there's nobody there. Because this is also an experience in consciousness. <coughs> this is as much an experience in consciousness as a tree, or as the flash of lightning in the sky. So think of yourself standing in front of a mirror, and the mirror is the screen of consciousness. We're all standing in that river and behind us the whole city. And of course, in the mirror, we all look different, but if you go in the screen, it's all one screen. Similarly, think of the screen of consciousness that contains all subjects of experience, all objects of experience, and all modes of experience. So this is what consciousness is. It's a possibility field which contains the subject. In this case, I'm the subject, you're the object. But for you, you're the subject, I'm the object. And for all of us, out there is the city, the object. It's all modifications of consciousness within itself as different apparent observers, <coughs> different apparent modes of perception, and different objects perceived. Now, if you want to include animals, then we include all sentient beings. Right here before us are infinite universes, all manifesting on the screen of consciousness as qualia. So there are mental qualia, like images, feelings, I didn't go into emotions, thoughts, and then there are perceptual qualia, what we call the physical world. But actually, it's a bundle of qualia. Okay, then we did a little experiment where we kind of reshuffled the qualia and we created a whole scene, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Then we said, that's not real, that's in the mental world. This is real, this is in the physical world, but actually it's just a denser form of qualia. Oh. Okay, so when you see a sunset, all you see is qualia within your own self, but memory says that's a sunset. So every perceptual structure is, of course, we've given labels to it. Roses and sunshine and sun and moon and stars, all happening within our own self. So what's the practical value of this? If you understand that there are subtle qualia and there are gross qualia. Mm -hmm. Subtle qualia meaning a high frequency of consciousness and gross qualia means a denser frequency of consciousness. Who's, who's in charge? Consciousness. So now you have to realize that consciousness is not a person, because the person is also a process in consciousness, right? Because the person was a baby, a child, a teenager, an adult, a process of qualia and consciousness. So qualia is the awareness, which is the ground of all existence, which we all share. But then we have our personal modes of experience, mental and perceptual, which we call the inner world and the outer world. But that's a misconstruction, mis, uh, because at the most fundamental level, consciousness is formless, it has no form, it is boundless, it has no boundaries. The experience of space, time, and boundaries is a result of qualia and constructs, human constructs. That's what we, how we are creating the human universe in our own self. So what's the value of this? These days people talk a lot about mindfulness. So the highest level of intelligence is to be silent witnessing awareness of any qualia. So you can choose a qualia. I could choose, just choose a candle. 
in a dark room with a flame and you just observe it. No, no labels, no definitions, no evaluation, just observe it. The silent knowing of an experience, we chose a candle. And if you do that for a while, you'll see, first of all, you can't hold on to it. You can't hold on to a thought. It comes out, it comes in, but soon you will transcend just by observing that particular quarry. Or you could observe a red dot, or you could listen to the first line of Imagine, John Lennon. Anything, any experience, sound, touch, sight, taste, and smell, if you observe it, silently witnessing it, that's the highest intelligence. And that is, the ultimate of that is called metacognition, where you observe yourself making a choice or having a sensory experience. Highest intelligence. No need to do anything more. So it's called mindfulness, but it's a misnomer, because you know, the awareness of the mind is not the mind. It's awareness. But, you know, awarefulness is too clumsy a word, so we'll accept mindfulness. But it is, this is what they mean by mindfulness. Awareness without judgment of any experience, whether it's a sensory experience, or a motor experience, or experiencing yourself having, making a choice or having an experience. If you stay with that highest level, intuitive knowledge of everything. So that, that's what they say in the Vedanta, know that one thing by knowing which everything else is known. Mm. The highest intelligence. The second level is, is what we call feeling. Okay, so again, feeling, if you feel love, if you feel compassion, if you feel joy, if you feel equanimity, peace, then that also connects you to all that is. Okay, so that's the second level of intelligence. The third level of intelligence is silent reflection. Who am I? What do I want? What's my purpose? Etc. The fourth level is speech. Okay, then now speech, there are very strong guidelines. Speak only if it's necessary. Before you speak, ask yourself, is it necessary? Second, ask yourself, is it useful? Third, Will it make a difference? Is it healing? Okay. If you can say yes to all these, then speak, otherwise don't speak. Because, as we said, God's language is silence. Everything else is poor translation. So the highest level of, uh, of speech and thought is reflective thought. And they say that if you live the questions, then life moves you into the answers through synchronicity. Because consciousness is not only a field of all possibilities, it's a field of correlation. It connects everything to everything else. It's a field of creativity. It's also a field of unpredictability. It's a field of intentionality. So when intention comes, like when I asked you to think of a, you know, a flash of lightning in the sky, there was no effort, right? You just plucked it out of that field of possibilities. So too in perceptual experience, Choose what to put your attention on. So to in sensory experience, choose what to put your attention on. You know, you go out and you hear the helicopter noise, you hear a voice, you hear the sound of uh, a waterfall, or the river, or the bird. Choose one. And you'll start to actually have a higher, it's called higher order knowing, mm -hmm. which in its ultimate experience is intuition. So how do they define intuition? A form of intelligence that is contextual, relational, holistic, doesn't have a win-lose orientation, goes beyond cause-effect, taps into cosmic consciousness. And the last thing is, um, is uh, what we call, so these are called yogas, so you know, Raj Yoga is the first yoga, uh, which is silent witnessing. Then. Um, Bhakti Yoga is the yoga of love, compassion, and speech also, the way we use. And then there's Jnana Yoga, reflection, and then there's finally Karma Yoga. So Karma Yoga is considered the least important, which means, what is Karma Yoga? Do good things, help poor people, charity, 
etc. Because a lot of people do that out of self-importance. You know, I feel good about myself. Who feels good? The ego feels good. So true karma yoga is do it, be silent about it, leave the results, and detach. Okay, that's true karma yoga. But even then it's considered, you know, not as superior as the others. Why? Because unless one is grounded in being, then it's, you know, they say action without love is meaningless and love without action is irrelevant. But when you have both and come from the deepest level, then karma yoga becomes a path to enlightenment too. Otherwise it becomes what they call social activism, which is a lot of angry peace activists out there. So this is the sequence, being, feeling, reflecting, speaking, and doing. Now where does all this fit in with all these other meditations? These are little branches, you know, mantra meditation, mindfulness, this. But the whole picture is, is very interesting because any one of these will lead you to the source. So yoga means, the word is yuj, which means union. English word yoke, when Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, that's yoga. So it's connecting back to the source of all that is, the source of the universe, the ground of the self, which is the ground of the universe. So, as a practical level, we went through this whole quality experience, you can choose one thing at a time. You know, you say, okay, today I'll be mind, this is also called vipassana, which is the right word. Actually, vipassana means insight. Okay, insight meditation, where you have silent witnessing awareness of one, one qualia. Could be anything. Could be red wine if you want. Okay, you just put your attention on what it is and you'll transcend. Okay, because what, where is that coming from? It's coming from awareness. Fine. So using the word awareness and consciousness synonymously, right? And how do we define? Because everybody's going to ask you, okay, you talk about consciousness all the time. What is it? So consciousness, awareness is that in which all experience occurs. Okay, we are having this experience where? In consciousness. Right? That in which all experience is known. This is easy. The third part is a little difficult. Out of which all experience is made. Because experience is a modification of consciousness. Thought is a modification of consciousness. Emotion is a modification of consciousness. Images are modifications of consciousness. Who was it that showed the slide of Einstein today? You know, he said, imagination is much more important than knowledge. Agriculture. 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 That's a famous quote, you know, because for Einstein, he came up with the math much, much later. He was to think of himself riding a beam of light across the cosmos, think of space-time bending, which is mind-boggling imagination. But from it came all his knowledge. And what is imagination? It's a modification of consciousness. Well, so, the easiest mindfulness, by the way, is breath awareness. So that was Buddha's first experience of transcendence. Just observing the breath without judgment. The second is feeling the sensations in your body. Then, then it gets complicated, you know, because you can mix qualia. The more you become an alchemist of qualia, in consciousness, you know, these days they talk about law of attraction very superficially. But the real law of attraction is you have done your qualia chemistry in consciousness and then that condensates into actual perceptual physical experience. That's real what we would call sankalp. Okay, the power of intention at that level through synchronicity. So we can talk more about this, but you know, one doesn't have to sit down for 20 minutes to transcend if you get into the habit of being mindfully aware, even once in a while. Now the, we have all these apps, by the way. Even uh, Apple has created an app which they asked me to endorse, which reminds you every once in a while to sit for half a minute or a minute or two minutes and quietly observe the breath. But that says that people are, this is getting mainstream, okay? 
because observing the breath is the first quality experience of the Buddha. And then observing silent witnessing awareness in the moment, because all experience happens in the moment. So when we track the history of the universe, 13.7 billion years, we did it in the moment. We tracked it through constructs, which we created in the moment. Actually, if we go deep into um, quantum mechanics, you learn there's no history. There are multiple histories. All is happening right now. Okay, so let's make a, you know, we can decide for tomorrow, for each of us, if you want to, that we can stop every few minutes, ask ourselves, am I aware, and then watch the breath for a minute. Slowly what will happen is that any time you are even slightly overshadowed by stress or what people call stress, you will stop and observe the breath and that will override. So stress is the scenery overshadowing the seer. Okay, so you just detach from the scenery, get in touch with the seer through either breath or through sensation or through any qualia experience. That's it. Short course. <laughs> oh, by the way, in You Are the Universe, there's a whole section in the appendix on qualia mechanics, okay, which is the first time, you know, I was in a silent retreat for a, for a month and I had the whole idea that we should replace quantum mechanics with qualia mechanics. So I called Menas, the physicist, who mm. wrote the book. I said, quantum mechanics is obsolete, let's start with qualia mechanics. He said, no, nobody's talked about this. I said, okay, I'll do it myself, then you, you know, do what you want. And then he went to Shivanand Ashram, and they were talking about how, not in these terms, but in Sanskrit terms, how qualia are the man mechanics of manifestation. So there's a whole section there, it's very, it's very abstract, arcane, because birth and death are qualia programs. So when you watch a program on television, there's a beginning, there's an ending, and there's all the stuff in between. So a particular lifetime is a qualia program. And when it's over, the screen of consciousness is still there, right? And the screen of consciousness holds the qualia in its memory as possibilities. Mm. That's what's called karma. Mm. And that's what vasanas are and sanskaras are. They are qualia programs mm -hmm. on the screen of consciousness, which is now at death. It's silent. And incubating till it decides to recycle as another qualia program. <clears throat> so birth and death are also constructs. In the deeper reality there's no such thing because there's no body, there's no mind, there's just bubbling qualia from formless consciousness. And we do sadhana to erase the vasana. Say that again? We do sadhana, meditation, To erase yoga, them if you want to. to but them. you know some